So for, for everyone who's been listening to our uh, private conversation there, welcome. Uh, my name is Lee Feliciano with New Use Energy. I'm gonna be your uh, host today uh, on this webinar, which is about using solar generators for emergency management. I'll introduce our guests uh, when we get to that point, but if you guys registered, you probably would have uh, caught a little bit of their bios. And bear with me, this is my first time using uh, the Zoom webinar edition. Uh, so if there's a, a few little glitches along the way, um, you'll know why. <clears throat> so I guess the first thing I wanted to do is just pause for a second on this slide uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, part of why we do what we do uh, and what motivated us to get into this space. Um, I'm not going to read off each of these headlines, but I think they're simply reminders of what's going on in the world today and why using solar generators uh, seems to be a, a compelling reason or a compelling argument. So first, a word from our sponsors, uh, which is New Use Energy. So, uh, you know, as a company, our mission is really to make clean energy, which is generated uh, from the sun, available to anyone, anywhere. And we accomplish that by focusing on mobile and rapidly deployable solar and battery solutions. As most of you guys know, solar is pretty ubiquitous these days in the world uh, you know, on a lot of people's rooftops, but the mobile component of solar is something that's relatively new to the market. And so new is really kind of an early entrant or early mover in that space. Um, and how we go about doing that is we replace a portable gas generator. So our focus as a company and as our initial market is really uh, you know, the, the place where replacing a gas generator has maximum value. And we find that's typically in you know, disaster scenarios where the grid is down or doesn't exist. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through some of our products, uh, but I don't want to take away from the main event, which is our guest speakers, uh, Will and Richard. So uh, just real quick, we have three categories of uh, solar generator products. So number one is our ultra portable power packs. Um, number two is our sun kits, which are slightly larger, uh, but we specifically designed to address the needs of uh, mid and long-term disaster relief situations. Uh, so the sun kits are modular, uh, but they're still portable uh, and they are field serviceable. And then finally, we have our Sunwing uh, multipurpose solar trailers. So those are our, our biggest products. Uh, this is essentially similar to you know, a, a, a fixed system or a static system, say on a roof, but we put them on wheels and we can move them around. And then finally, uh, to complement those, those are the batteries and the inverters. Uh, we also provide a line of highly portable lightweight solar panels and canopies. Um, the one thing about our products is you can really use any solar panel with them, including solar panels that you actually recover on the scene. Uh, but if you want something that's really portable and durable and easier to transport, uh, we offer uh, specialized solar panels for that purpose. So let me switch to the main event here. So uh, our first speaker is Will Hegard. Um, I'm not going to read his bio because it was already posted uh, and you probably read it when you uh, registered before you registered. But uh, let me just say by way of introduction that uh, Will and Footprint Project uh, have been uh, <clears throat> working with us since the beginning. In fact, uh, it's a big part of, again, why we're in this business. Uh, I met Will about four years ago, and uh, we work with Footprint on a regular basis, both to deploy our equipment in the field. Uh, so Footprint Project is a, a user of our equipment, and they're also one of our best uh, you know, testers in terms of providing us feedback and guidance on uh, how to improve, how to develop and improve uh, news mobile solar generators. 
So Will, um, I'm just gonna move to the next slide and then uh, I'll uh, pass it over to you. Hey, Will. Will, can you hear me? Hey guys, can you hear me? Oh, oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Nothing like a little, uh, you know, technical uh, emergency <laughs> to make it interesting. Now I gotta make sure I don't kick both relays. Hold on, let me kill this one. Yeah, we can, hear you now. can you see the slide? Yeah. Um, sorry about that. That's what happens when uh, telecommunications networks get weird in uh, New Orleans. So, uh, Lee, I, I dropped off right when you were introducing us. Just, okay. I should, I'm just going to power through and um, give a little background to first to Footprint Project. So, um, Lee, thanks for running the slides. Um, it's and thank you. Thanks again to everybody for, for uh, chiming in here and, and listening to our story about how we have deployed uh, cleaner energy for disaster relief and recovery missions. We started this work in 2018, um, really focused on supporting domestic first and second responders with access to mobile solar uh, generators to offset or displace uh, portable gas and diesel generators during those extended disaster power outages. So we started putting kind of repurposed and upcycled solar battery equipment on trailer frames or in portable uh, boxes and deploying them to charge up um, community first and second responders. And when I say first responders, I'm talking about paramedics, fire departments, um, the, the local uh, first in folks. And then second responders, we're talking about, you know, the, the NGOs that respond kind of in that second wave, the American Red Cross, Team Rubicon, Salvation Army, all the folks that, that also spend um, time, money, resources, and struggle with delivering power uh, and, and energy in those, those challenging situations that, that we find ourselves in. Um, so yeah, our mission is to provide cleaner energy for communities in crisis. We've done this in a variety of different ways, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about how different scenarios can be matched with uh, cleaner solar energy systems like new use equipment or other equipment that's out there in the market um, to provide a um, better response for, for the communities impacted. So Lee, you can jump to the, the next slide, thanks. Okay, will do. Oh, sorry, one thing I just wanted to add to the, uh, the audience, uh, we'll save the Q&A uh, for after Rich Burt's presentation. So we've got at least 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. Awesome, thanks. Lee. So yeah, I'm just gonna talk about a couple different sites that we see that come up often um, when we're deploying to a large scale power outage. And, and just to give some additional context, when we are talking about this equipment, it's the, the size of the generators that we are deploying using solar and battery storage are kind of equivalent to a uh, two to 10 kilowatt portable gas or diesel generator. So we're not really pushing past that, you know, grid scale or backup um, building generators, which are usually in the 25 to up to a megawatt scale gen sets, the ones that you'll see like behind a fire station or behind a, a hospital. A lot of what the work that we're doing is working in parallel to the grid, basically displacing those portable gas generators that you'll find in Home Depot or that are running kind of a mobile food, you know, a food truck or a a distribution site or kind of all these other little um, spaces that pop up after or in the in in a large scale uh, emergency. So this is the first site in the photo on the left. There is a pop up aid station 
that we powered up after the Araby tornado in New Orleans just this past March. It came off, um, the system was, was used during Ida and then redeployed during the tornado. And it's for size comparison, it's kind of a two man lift and it kind of compares to a two kilowatt portable generator. So it has a couple solar panels that two people can carry and set up. And then the, the box there in the yellow is, has a four kilowatt hour battery. So that's kind of your gas tank. And then a two kilowatt inverter, which can spit out electrons at that two kilowatt comparison. So in the dark, it could run for two hours without you know, any sun or recharge. And then during the day, based on the size of the solar panel array you have out, it could run um, considerably longer as long as the, the sun shining. So this, in this site, it was actually set up at a bar outside of, a, you know, that was affected by the tornado, but then kind of became an area where folks who were severely affected by the tornado that had their homes destroyed could come to process um, paperwork, connect uh, on Wi-Fi, recharge their phones, power laptops under the, the exterior kind of uh, shade that the bar still had in that neighborhood. And then uh, as well as it, it was powering the chest freezer uh, of the, the facility, which was, which was repurposed instead of using, you know, it wasn't storing uh, 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 the chest freezer in the fridge. They were being used to store food and medicine instead of alcohol and, and beer. Um, same type of fridge that can store, uh, you know, Coronas can also store insulin. So I, we uh, see that often as a kind of a repurpose. Um, Lee, you can jump to the next site, but, but for that one, it's just a portable system that can power up a, a kind of corner um, mutual aid station. And uh, sorry, just for uh, clarification, Will, when you talked about how it can power, uh, it can run for two hours, that's, that's assuming the genera generator is running at full capacity, right? So if you're running a fridge and computers, you can pretty much run all night. Yeah, and that's a great... I, Lee, I think it brings up a really good point that, that we should, I, I would love to stress is that a lot of times, particularly responders, but also folks that are just more familiar with traditional single source fossil fuel generators are really rating their power needs based on the generator and not rating them based on what they're plugging in. So you can get by with a lot smaller of a system if you, if you actually do your energy math. Um, so we see this a lot of times where people are running a really big, like a seven kilowatt or even 10 up to 25 kW generator. And when we're looking at what they're actually running off of it, you could do it with a much, much, much smaller system. The traditional single source fossil fuel generators are not designed to run at low idle. So it's like they're, they're not, it, it actually is bad for the long-term maintenance of the generator to to not run in that kind of 20 to 70% of the energy output ratio. So when, if you're looking at kind of, all right, I have a, you know, a mobile incident command center that has a 20 kW gen set, I'd really encourage folks on this call to, to look at what you really use that gen set for, and then you can get by with a hybridized or um, solar battery system that might be much smaller in comparative um, KW range than what you um, originally imagine needing. Um, and we see this all the time. You know, this, this, before we set up this portable two kilowatt system, they were running a seven kilowatt Rolly generator to power all this. And we ran this whole aid station with a quote unquote two kilowatt solar generator. So kind of just a, a good example of how, when, if you're gonna go down this rabbit hole, for your, your emergency management or resilience programming, you really need to start with the energy loads and the critical loads that you want to energize and then work up into what system is appropriate for those loads. In the past, it's really been a top-down energy math. Hey, we're gonna get a 30 kW generator and then we'll just find fuel for it. And that math doesn't really work anymore, particularly when the, the fossil fuel supply chains are so expensive and, and um, you know, challenging in large scale disasters.
Okay, and uh, before I advance to the next slide, I see we're getting some questions come in. So again, we'll, we'll save uh, those till the end. Cool. So this next site was uh, outside of a church in North Nashville. It was, I, it's kind of a, I would describe it as a bigger food distribution and donation drop site that was set up after the, the Nashville tornadoes, uh, tornado in, in March of 2020. This we deployed a, actually that's New Use Energy's trailer. Um, it has a Footprints logo on it look, um, nicely, but um, this one was a, two kilowatt solar array on the roof of that trailer. So it had solar panels on the roof and then slide outs with a 10 kilowatt hour battery bank. And that could run um, at a, with a five kilowatt inverter. So it can kind of comparatively looks like a five kilowatt portable generator, single source, if you were gonna use a, the fossil fuel ones. And this was running refrigerators um, at that site, um, computers, laptops, I love this photo because it was one of the first times we saw a um, uh, gentleman with accessibility issues that lived down the street that was an electric wheelchair that he would drive up every day and charge his electric wheelchair off of it. We see we never know what people are going to plug in when we deploy this equipment. So it's it's all we're, we're learning as we do it. Um, but for this site, you know, it's kind of the medium sized aid station or, or um, application for the for a towable solar generator that's really well suited for 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 this type of um, relief program so the church was setting up you know food distro and and they had some fridges the power was out for two weeks and that system was running that equipment as well as powering some led lights at night for security um so a little bit bigger system um but you know, not something you could just lift with two people, um, but it, it was, it, it worked really well for those two weeks before the grid came back on. Um, well, you can go to the next one. And then on, this is probably the biggest site we've ever done. Um, this is a volunteer base camp after Hurricane Ida that was located in Homa, Louisiana. And actually, Lee, if you just skip to the next slide, you'll see the thing from the, um, the top, down, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that's the drone photograph of the same site. So you had, we had three or three volunteer tents and then a sleeping tent. There was a, a kitchen in the tent on the bottom left. And then a medical tent was the middle one. And then the right on the bottom right was a um, just covered storage for pallets of food that was being dropped off and then distributed out within the community. On this, you know, you see four tennis courts that whole solar array in the top right, that was um, a, ended up being, we started with 10 kilowatts of PV, which is about a pallet of solar panels that we set up on ground mounts. And as the site grew, we added more solar to power. Um, what started was a palletized solar battery bank that had about 25 kilowatt hours of usable energy and 12 kilowatts of output. So kind of like a, comparatively like a 10 kilowatt generator. And then we added more palletized systems as the site expanded. So at one point we had three of those palletized batteries running to run the whole camp, including air conditioning, a commercial fridge, multiple chest freezers, communications, lighting, all night cell phones. This was really kind of like an operation base for what, you know, it, with the people coming in and out and staying ranging from 10 to, to 20 or 30 people at a time. So this was by far, you know, a, a much more um, kind of a operations or command space. And you can see the, you know, to run that space for two, two months through um, sunny and cloudy days, it took a considerable amount of, of battery storage. But what what we are, are learning with these operations is you can scale up or down. You know, we started with one system and as the site grew, we added more. And then as it got kind of slowed down in the, once the kind of immediate response bled into long-term recovery, um, we, could, we could just take one system out at a time as the, as the site contracted. Um, so just as a kind of overview that our goal is to do a lot more of this work in the future, particularly with emergency management and response partners, uh, we are 
really looking out to at ways of decarbonizing disaster relief, particularly as climate emergencies become the driving power outage disaster in the domestic US. So as we develop these partnerships, if anybody on the call is looking for, for equipment, either for an immediate response or something in, in prepping for, for this year's hurricane and wildfire season, um, please reach out because oftentimes Footprint Project does have either equipment locally staged or regionally staged or volunteers that can help kind of do your energy math for you. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really excited to help and, and it really takes kind of the emergency management community and the disaster response community really asking for this, these solutions in order for them to, to be practically implemented. So I know Rich has, has his background as a firefighter. I used to be a paramedic. And to be honest, if you don't ask for the equipment you need to do your job, you know, we all know this, you're not gonna get it, so. With that, thanks, thanks for having us, Lee. Thanks, Will. And uh, before I switch to the next slide, sorry, I, I can't resist looking at this photograph uh, and thinking that those solar panels on the ground, uh, and I know we didn't have the equipment at the time, but could have been our sun canopy solar tents. Uh, so you would have been able to use the space underneath the solar panels, but. Um, totally. And you, those shelters are definitely structurally sound enough to hold flexible panels. So you could drape um, flexible panels over them, um, right. or you could use outdoor, you know, the rigid pole structures that you guys have too. So there's, you can get really creative with this, you know, how you generate and store power for a relief mission. Um, for this site, it was, it, it avoided, you know, they never had to get, get in a, gas you know they were running a generator for a couple days before we got the system set up and then for the rest of the two months they were not you know they never had to stand on a gas line the folks you know other responders were driving three hours to mississippi to get gas so when you're really looking at the kind of holistic cost of a yeah. single source fossil fuel program it um you know there's there's unique benefits to to doing it um a different way yeah cool um, so thanks, Will, and uh, uh, we'll, I guess we'll come back during the Q&A session, but uh, uh, our next speaker is Captain Richard Burt. Um, again, I'm not going to read through his bio. That was part of the, uh, the ad during the registration, but uh, I just wanted to point out as well that uh, we work very closely with Richard, um, not just in terms of, um, you know, supporting him, but also supporting, uh, you know, his safe training, which is uh, a service that he offers at no cost to firefighters across the country, uh, or should I say across the world, Rich? I know you've been, uh, yeah. uh, you know, in other countries uh, spreading the word, um, which relates to solar and battery fire safety. Um, very relevant topic these days, but uh, let me, switch over to the next slide and uh, I will hand it off to you, Rich. Great, thank you guys, good morning. And uh, yeah, I've got some really, uh, my input on this is about life and death. So kind of cut to the chase, uh, been a firefighter for 30 years. I did 20 years in Las Vegas and 10 years in Ohio. I was a medic for 27 of those years. I was on a heavy rescue, one of the busiest in the world for 10 years. Now with renewables, I lived off the grid. So I lived off, sold on batteries for 16 years. So I understand what the technology is. And my biggest goal was to apply this technology to save lives. So as we look at it right now, especially teaching around the country, talking to uh, all the firefighters in Colorado who lost power to their stations uh, during the, the, the most devastating and destructive Colorado in the Colorado history fire, they lost power to their stations because they cut the natural gas off to all the generators. But what I'm looking at for emergency managers, and I just got back from Niagara County and Livingston County in New York, is this. We have a new technology. It's the generator is 100 years old and we've been using it. And that's all we use in our world. In the life saving world, we use generators. And two things that I've learned from doing disaster relief is basically you run out of fossil fuel, number one, or the main lines cut off. And what happens is if we lose power in our world, people die. It's as simple as that. There's no like getting around that. So the question is, is there a better way? 
can we combine them? Can we look at both properties and can we can we look at a newer way of doing this? And all the research I'm doing, all the teaching I'm doing, and listening to emergency uh, managers across the world is how do we get electrons out there that save lives? For instance, the portable units that we're looking at. So you go from the small portable unit that's basically handheld or is a suitcase size. You can use that for so many different, basically emergencies that we, my job is to educate you on where you can pair these up. So what I'm doing right now, if you look at the slide, is just talking to the fire service about how do we use this new technology? Lee, if you go to the next slide, we'll dig into this a little bit. So in Puerto Rico and Louisiana, it was very simple. There was no electricity. So we went to the larger size and we put in solar and batteries on fire stations and got fire stations basically up and running. But we can also do that with a portable trailer. So not all fire stations need a 50 kW backup. A lot of them just need lights, open the doors, communications. So what we're doing is we're matching some of the trailer technology with critical station backup. And from there, that's a portable unit. So let's say the power comes back on in one area. What I was noticing, I was putting solar and batteries on a fire station and going, well, the power just came back on. Okay, but we've got four fire stations that don't have power. And I'm thinking, okay, we spent this time putting these on the roof of this fire station and mounting them. But if we had a trailer, we could just turn around and take that trailer to the next couple of fire stations that didn't. With the earthquake, as soon as there's structural damage, you can't use that system. So to me, the idea of breaking this down into a trailer, especially for emergency managers, to be able to put this thing on wheels and transport it from A to B with a large amount of storage and a large amount of solar, because like Lee said, we can build these canopies around the trailer. So if we're using a trailer with a heavy load, we just build shelter above our heads with solar panels. So that's the one concept that we're looking at is definitely tr the trailer based energy instead of a fixed unit is gonna be really the future for emergency management being able to move it around. And then uh, on the right, when I'm looking at it, this was in a nursing home full of veterans who had no power. And we simply, uh, this was a matter of life and death. These people, diabetes between diabetes diabetes, emphysema, asthma, they're on nebulizers, um, CPAP. What we did is we did a smaller amount of electricity that literally made the difference between these people living and dying and desatting and coming to the going to the hospital. So what I'm seeing is different amounts of electricity. So we went from the large trailer concept down to flashlights to portable units that could run a nebulizer. Think about people living with emphysema and asthma in an emergency where they're on the fence and they generate a 911 call because they can't get their nebulizer. If we can drop off a small unit and get that person up and running, we're talking about number one, taking a call out of the 911 center. Number two, we're not basically helping a person desat and buy a tube. So let's go to this next one. There, I had the pleasure of going to Humboldt County in California to do basically a, uh, an educational series on safety and on wildland fire. So this applied technology for wildfire is unbelievable in the sense that it's portable. If you imagine fire camps running generates 24 hours a day, basically you've got firefighters eating smoke for days and then coming into a diesel generated area where they're eating diesel and they're listening to diesel 24 hours. If we can silence that up and clear the air up, we're just looking at a much firefighter friendly, safe environment. Plus Humboldt County has some areas where literally the fire stations are cut off. There's no fuel supply. And so what we were looking at is strategically putting these in areas where we know that. And it's critical for the emergency managers to understand you've already identified your weak spots. The question is, can we build assets around those weak spots so they're deployable right away? So you have a bank of these. You, what you do as an emergency manager, you build a portfolio of renewable energy that sits on a shelf 
that is not like a generator. Uh, all my young guns on the heavy rescue work for FEMA. And basically what you're looking at is this huge inventory of gasoline and diesel generators with fuel. And they just sat and didn't do anything on a shelf. This technology is a lot more easy to handle that way and deployable. So what I want the emergency managers to start thinking about is having these assets ready to be deployed to the areas they know are vulnerable. Let's go to the next slide, Lee. Okay, so this is one of my big lecture points. When I travel around the country, I put this slide up and I use the reference of uh, power safety shutoffs in California to let's say 300,000 people. What does that look like to the power companies? Well, the, the suits at the power company decide to shut the power off, which I understand because of the wind conditions, fire conditions, and they don't want a line drop. But what does that mean to emergency managers? What does that mean to fire service? Well, I use this example. This, this, this lady has emphysema asthma and she's on a nasal cannula 24 hours a day, two liters, not much, two liters, okay? Now, what happens to her? And I wanna dig into this with the politicians, with the power company, what happens when the power goes out? She doesn't have a backup generator. She's not going outside and, and starting a generator. So to me, at this point, she desats, she goes to a backup oxygen tank that lasts about an hour, and then she calls 911. So we have this massive influx of emergencies. They've got nothing to do with an emergency. It's literally, she doesn't have access to electron. So what we do is we look at this and say, what would power that? What would keep her in her home, shelter in place? What would stop her from calling 911? And it's a very small amount of electricity that we could deploy and think about identifying all the vulnerable citizens in your area in emergency management well, you could deploy this and basically start reducing the 911 calls, not because it's a medical emergency from a structural collapse, a tree falling on somebody. It's from basically not having an electron. When I went to Puerto Rico and was on the ground two weeks after Hurricane Maria, I knew over 2000 people were dying because of not having electricity. It wasn't structural collapse. It wasn't trees, it wasn't drowning. I sussed that out immediately. The initial deaths were from that, but really the main damage was because there weren't electrons. In Louisiana, I talked to a chief, said they already had six carbon monoxide deaths in the first week because of generators. So what we're looking at is a new way, a new technology, it's safer and it's deployable. That's the biggest thing for us. If we can get this out, to the communities you're protecting at a level that we haven't seen before, that we could really build into all the communities of resiliency that we have to. Emergency managers around the country are going to have to build this kind of resiliency. So going through those types of electrons, we could sit down and actually build SOPs where we can look and say, okay, we have this size portable packs, what would they be good for? We go to the intermediate portable packs, where would we deploy these? And then we have the trailers. And so what you can do is build a portfolio of energy that basically will save lives. And it would be like having different sized tanks on your engine. So some parts of the country I go, it's a thousand gallon tank. They, they, have, they don't have good water source. And then other parts of the country, like Las Vegas, we had a 500 because we had a hydrants. So you could build the same resiliency around with electrons and deploying electrons. We're now staffing. We understand after COVID, we understand having supplies. These supplies are storable. That's the other part of this, especially being on a heavy rescue. So we can understand that. So, I mean, my takeaways are, we can use the sun as a primary resource. Like I said, what I see is vulnerability at the fuel source level. If you can store electricity, use electricity where it is, what we're looking at is a different way of deploying. And solar generators can regulate your gas or diesel generate. So at this point, what we're looking at too is Let's take the generators that are out there. And I lecture this all the time. A generator doesn't know whether you've got one light bulb on or a full firehouse or a full medical or a full 
comms going in an IC. A generator is just going to bang away at a certain speed and burn fuel. Battery knows exactly what you're using. So what you do is you use a generator to charge the battery and then the battery uses a smart electron to run the camp. So we have a backup to the backup. I'm not saying we don't use this, but we use it wisely. So location, time and year or weather. Those are things where talking around the country and teaching this, some areas, that's where you build that portfolio of energy. In. Some areas need more solar panels because of clouds and bad weather. Some areas need more storage. But what we could do is look at the, what we have to deploy and then build a sensible structure of deployable electrons to the area you're in. And there's, there's basically a line in the United States halfway up through the country. And those are the two lines that I've seen. And you adjust to what part of that, which side of the line you're on. Do I have any more slides, Lee? Um, no, I, I, I think that's it. Sorry, there's supposed to be a, a, a Q&A slide over here. Um, but uh, why don't we switch over? We, we have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, Rich, I'll, I'll let you wrap up. Do you have any kind of last words of wisdom before we switch over to Q&A? I think working with emergency managers across the country, if we can't provide the power, people will die. So what we've got to do is learn. And that's my part of my job is to educate and learn and deploy a newer source of power that will save lives. So thanks, thanks very much, Rich. Um, so uh, let me read off uh, some of the questions here that uh, um, people from the audience have asked. Uh, and this is, I guess this is uh, posed to, to anyone who wants to, to weigh in, uh, Rich or, or, uh, or Will. Um, so the first question is, how do the critical loads connect to the portable solar microgrid? Do you essentially plug a power strip into the battery, then plug all the critical loads into the power strip? And uh, sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll take that for an example, just from the firewall site is we're looking at like these solar trailers. Okay, so let's say you have a small fire station in California, like in Humboldt, and we come across a, a fire station that loses power all the time. Number one, what are the loads that are run? So we, we connect it to a sub panel. So basically what you do is you build into a sub panel just like the generators and that is connected to that sub panel at the fire station level. And then if you're in a command situation, you basically have field tents, maybe medical out there, some trailers, you've got some pop-ups going. At that point, it's the same idea. You're running your extension cord instead of from a generator that you have to put away from your comms. You can actually store your power right inside the tent with you with a portable, basically, cable with plugins. So that's the idea of this. The generator is away from you. You're running cords. You're running back up into it. These systems work inside the actual command center no noise, no fumes, and you're running shorter cores and it's it's less spaghetti. Does that answer that question, you think? Yeah, thanks. And uh, just wanted to add to that, I guess, as the equipment provider. Um, so I, I guess the my answer to that would be, it depends on which equipment you're deploying, right? So the portable power packs, uh, Rich, as you pointed out, you can, you can take into your tent or even your vehicle or your building uh, because there's no, no, no fumes, no emissions. And so those would act like a, you know, like a small generator where you plug directly into the device uh, or you plug an extension cord and then plug into it. Um, but some of the larger units like the sun kits and or the trailers, uh, depending on the circumstances and the duration of the power outage, uh, you have the ability, if the, uh, yeah, if the ability is there, to essentially backfeed, uh, you know, we'd recommend putting in a transfer switch, of course, uh, so if the grid comes back up, you're not feeding into the grid by mistake, but you have the ability, just like a, a larger generator, 
to back feed into your electrical panel. Um, <clears throat> Will, do you have any uh, other thoughts on that? No, I mean, the only thing I'd add is that I think it's a fantastic question. The, the opportunities for integrating or using different sized portable to towable to containerized or palletized battery systems with varied versions of solar panels, tents, ground mount, rooftop, all of this is gonna get really interesting and there's like a number of ways you can plug in. The, from a very, very basic standpoint, you're not plugging in in order to get 120 volt usable power, right? The outlet that you see in your home, you're not plugging in directly to the battery, you're plugging into an inverter that converts DC electricity to usable AC which is what we all use you know, for normal stuff. Some tech uses 12 volt DC, um, but most of the time you're using that inverter to, to transfer or change those electrons from DC electrons into 120 volt AC or 12240 AC that can be run into a, a standard breaker panel or an outlet that you would plug your nebulizer or your emergency command center or whatever in. So as long as you're using that inverter, you're, you're getting that, um, that usable AC power. And I'm just gonna add in the chat here, um, Footprint Project does have a solar smart hands uh, training on a, a website, open source website called HeatSpring. And it does, a, we've worked, a, you know, using our experience working with emergency managers and second responders and training them on how to use this equipment during disasters. We have this, you know, just a very basic overview of how to um, deploy solar generators, different types, different sizes. And I'll just add that there in case people are, are interested. One, one thing I would just add for emergency managers is pure sine wave. So when you're looking at a Honda generator banging away or a, a 6K generator, sometimes the, the, the actual electricity is really dirty and it's very, very bad for comms equipment. So that's the other really important thing. Our world is run off CAD and sensitive communications. To be able to provide our sensitive communications equipment with pure sine wave is huge. Huge in the, because basically what we're looking at is if you lose comms or uh, you, you start degrading the comm systems right off the bat with some dirty electricity from a generator, what we're looking at is a vulnerability there where comms could go down. So that's a massive, that the military are recognizing, a massive advantage too. All right. Thanks, Rich. So um, let me move on to the next question. Um, so... Will talked about the energy math and its importance to the efficient use of energy. Is there a software opportunity to create a simple fill in the blank program that will help emergency staff quickly calculate the energy requirements of the situation? Or does such a program already exist? I can absolutely drop our link to our basic energy load calculator on our website. You can also find our resources at footprintproject.org slash tools. There is a whole drive, Google Drive folder with assessment forms, Excel sheets, different ways of trying to calculate your usable or needed energy. So I'll make sure to drop that load in the chat. I definitely say there's an opportunity to make it simpler and make it more user-friendly for particularly rapid um, energy assessments, off-grid or microgrid calculations for, for you know, a, a response logistician instead of a doubly electrical engineer. A lot of times we get kind of backed into a very, very fancy engineering <laughs> or, or the, the complex stuff when, when for, for us, you know, firefighters, emergency managers, response people, we really like to keep it simple. Um, so there's definitely a space there for a, for a, to build a better app, quote unquote. Um, I would love to talk to anybody who's thinking about doing that because we, we've never been able to find the funding yet for Footprint Project to, to develop an online tool that could rapidly assess energy needs and then size uh, microgrid equipment for that field site using either you know a drone photo or a whatever. A lot of it comes down to how much space you have for the panels, how much, where are you putting the batteries and what are the loads and kind of making that, you know, field assessment work. 
Um, so yeah, if there, if there are, you know, interests in, in developing a fancier version, we'd love, I'd love to talk about that. And Ava, I see, see you noted, noted this. Absolutely. Um, in the meantime, I'll drop our, our basic energy load calculator Excel sheet uh, in the chat because that's what we use right now. Yeah. And I, I guess I, yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that too, because we, we field test a lot of our equipment and a lot of times the way we field test it is to try and find sort of real world opportunities to place the equipment and get feedback from users uh, rather than, you know, kind of a, a more a clinical sort of lab test. And, you know, what I, what I find is the, the most accurate answer to that question is really, it depends on the equipment you're running, right? Because uh, certain types of equipment, let's say power tools, yeah, you can look at the equipment specifications and you can say, well, you know, I'm going to run this pump for five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And you can get a realistic uh, understanding of how much energy you're going to use or how much of the battery's capacity you're going to take up. On the other hand, if you use equipment like a refrigerator uh, or an air conditioner where it cycles, right? You have your compressor kind of kicking on and off. Um, it really depends on a host of variables, right? Like the ambient temperature, uh, what you've got inside. And so uh, you can come up with a rough estimate, uh, but yeah, there, there are a lot of variables that could change what that actual number is, right? In terms of how much of the, the battery's capacity in particular you're using. So I think uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the takeaway from that based on our experience is, yeah, nothing beats, you know, testing out your equipment and just really kind of educating yourself, right, about uh, how much energy does it take if I run my air conditioner 24 hours when it's 110 degrees out, um, because your compressor is not running constantly. Um, yeah, I've got a, a, one thing I do is I teach the firefighters, and basically I use a, a engine pumping as a good example and when i say that you have a tank full of water and then or you hook to the hydrant and you have an intake valve that tells you how much you can draw off that and people pulling lines and want to pull more lines off your rig if you get to zero on your intake valve or your five inch starts sucking in you say no so the cool thing about this technology is that basically you can start plugging stuff in and learning as you go too so you can say okay there's a massive draw coming in. My batteries drop this amount. If I unplug one thing, maybe what I can do is extend. So there's a real world option to this. There's yeah. figures out there, but I really stress my world doesn't work in figures. Those guys wear white shirts and set desks. My world is about real world getting out there and you can play with this stuff and there's flexibility. That's the beautiful thing about this stuff. That's why the military are using. This is flexible. Get to know your equipment. And that's what we can do with this technology is you can get to know the power source through deployment, through training, through real life. Yeah, thanks, Rich. No, I think that's great advice. And um, one other thing I want to mention, because I started doing this last year and we will uh, start to post videos on our YouTube channel about this. But speaking of real world situations, um, when I was testing out our sun kits, um, you know, I was plugging into the sun kit various appliances like instant pots and induction burners and, you know, taking a read of how many watt hours or kilowatt hours uh, it took to, you know, make a pot of chili or, you know, cook up a steak, right? And, uh, or, or, you know, bake a pizza in a toaster oven. And I was posting those results and actually they were... Um, quite informative even to me because I'd never done it before uh, at really how you know how modest some of these needs are like you can you know you have two regular solar panels producing about 700 watts um, it only takes about you know half an hour to 45 minutes worth of energy from those two solar panels to cook a steak right um, so that, you know those are some of kind of the real world examples um, anyway, let me uh, move on here. We've got uh, about 10 minutes more, so I think we can address most of these questions. Um, next question is, 
how easy is it to move the solar between various temporary sites and a warehouse when not needed for use? Um, I can respond, but Will, I think you probably, uh, you know, have more real world experience with that. Sure, I can start. Um, yeah. The So traditional glass frame solar panels, the ones you see in a field somewhere or on someone's roof, each of those panels are about three feet by six feet and weigh about 50 pounds each. So when we set up like that ground mount system in uh, home on those tennis courts, that those panels were each showed up in a pallet and we, and we uh, dragged them off of a flatbed, you know, a tow behind trailer, and then at a team of volunteers carry them to ground mount racking. So it's kind of a, you need a forklift or a, or a lot of bodies to move those panels. And then the flexible panels that, that Lee, you know, has shown with tents and stuff, they just are lighter but they, and they're not, they don't have any glass or aluminum. So they're a lot um, less, you know, dangerous in terms of cutting, you're getting scraped by the edges and stuff like that. Or but damaging they, they still, yeah, but they, and they're flexible. So you can throw them in the back of a pickup. Um, you still, if you're doing a large deployment, you're probably going to need a forklift. I think the interesting part of the towable systems that have solar panels on the roof is that you don't really want to warehouse them, right? Like the goal, leave them outside because that's how they charge. So if you're if you're using an integrated mobile solar generator that has the the solar panels on the roof of the trailer or very easily deployable, the it wants to be in a parking lot. So I think one of those, um, you know, if you're looking around at the your local. Uh, American Red Cross or Salvation Army, where there are a lot of existing mobile infrastructure units, whether those are mobile kitchens or cargo trailers or units that, that are um, kind of sitting idle in a par parking lot. All I see when I see those parking lots are opportunities to add um, a couple solar panels on each roof and a battery in, in each one and, and turn them into a mobile uh, generator as well. So I think yeah. that's one of the exciting parts from a policy or a, a you know, larger um, planning perspective is how to utilize the infrastructure that's already being um, staged in regions for disasters and upgrade them with these new technologies that can make them really flexible response assets. Yeah, the, uh, the storage too, the storage basically, especially the batteries, you can turn the main breaker off and those things will store and you can turn it on a year later and you've got 80 percent of that battery but like on the trailers what a real world example of that is basically the fire service are thinking about using the trailers like my heavy rescue in, in vegas they asked so they have all this electrical equipment shorelines that they have to plug in other equipment that they have to run a, a, a line out to and it's very expensive and usually you're storing stuff, especially emergency management. You've got all sorts of shorelines. You've got sort of all sorts of equipment on standby. You actually use the trailer as a shoreline feed. So you can actually just actively use it every single day, especially when you start storing equipment outside or you have areas where you have a massive amount of equipment with a shoreline. You can just use it as a, basically an AC source that you can take anywhere. So the from the trailer standpoint, the trailer should be plugged into a sub panel at a fire station when it's not in use and actually actively every day using and taking some of that load off that fire station. Number one, saving the fire department money. Number two, you use it every single day. It's not like a generator. That's the whole concept of this is a generator. You have to turn it on and you're burning fossil fuel. These things can store and be basically used every single day without any kind of purchase. So that's the new concept of being able to store batteries, turn them off and be able to pull them off a shelf. Plus also the trailers actually actively used every single day. Thanks, Rich. No, that's a great answer. And uh, I want to add one thing real quick before I move on to the next question. So uh, at New Use Energy, we, we think of our equipment that isn't a trailer, like stuff that's portable um, as a yeah, is this a one person or a two person carry? Uh, and so, you know, most of our power packs are one person carries. 
Uh, our largest power pack, which weighs over 100 pounds, close to 150, we consider that a two-person carry. Yeah, the sun kit, uh, which depending on the battery in it, uh, can weigh up to 200 plus pounds. Again, that's a two-person uh, carry, uh, yeah, just to put in the back of a pickup truck. So, uh, But all of them are designed to be portable. And uh, I just got some news uh, while, while this uh, webinar was going on that uh, the first of 10 pallets of equipment that we shipped to Ukraine has just landed and is being deployed in the field as we speak. And so uh, super exciting. I just wanted to share that with you guys because again, it's all designed to be, uh, the stuff we shipped is actually all one person carry. So literally one person can carry uh, the solar generator, the power pack uh, and tuck you know, 400 watts of solar under their arm, right? Or, uh, you know, for, for, for greater speed, you can have one person carry the panels, one person carry the power pack. But the point is it's it's highly mobile. Um, just wanna move on to the next question. So we're, we're running out of time here. Um, and I am, this is a long one, so I'm just going to uh, edit slightly. Uh, so this is addressed to Rich. Uh, hello, Captain Burt. Have you considered speaking to directors of fire management and fire schools around the country in order to educate them? Um, and then she says, uh, I live in Oro Valley, which uh, Rich is, is just north of Tucson, just FYI. Uh, where the big horn fire was last year. Have you considered talking to fire chiefs and incident managers here about those systems? So I was in Tucson Fire, just taught the whole of Tucson Fire. So my class is about resiliency and firefighting uh, strategies and tactics. So yes, I'm, yes, I am in Tucson and I was there and I spent a week there teaching. So and now I'm talking to the department just northwest of Tucson there. They've reached out to me uh, to, to do some training. So, yes, I'm active across the country. Just got back from Charleston, South Carolina and taught there and basically Pensacola, Florida. So I think the critical thing is if you have a venue that you want me to talk at about resiliency, about renewable energy, um, I'd be happy to do it. I'm, I'm sponsored. I'm, I'm sponsored by an industry that thinks firefighter safety and resiliency is important. So I can go and do this for free. So at this point, yes, my goal is to get across. And yes, I am. I'm doing a lot of talking because it's critical information. Yeah, that's great. And just a follow up to that. Um, she says, how about senior communities? I live in a senior community. Management has no plan for generating electricity to homes here. As a senior, we need air conditioning and ability to charge phones, et cetera. These are life-saving for us. So um, hey, I guess- Just add, yeah. talk to the second question too, because I think we can answer yeah. both in the last minute. Okay. Um, so should I, do you want me to move on to the next question? Sorry, well, I wasn't- Yeah, I think they're the same one in the yeah. sense that doing the the you know facilities that are that might need just portable systems yes. to run small small medical device loads okay yeah so yeah so the second question uh was recalling slide presentation with a patient at home relying on her nebulizer uh a low load medical device 24 7 your solution would need to be a dedicated small unit for each home does new have a ready commercial solution for this so, uh, so the, the answer is yes, that is actually our smallest uh, power pack. And let me see if I can go back. Um, so so the, the quick answer is yes. And the smallest power pack, the smallest device that we offer can power a nebulizer or a CPAP all weekend before it needs to recharge. Um, and then you can actually charge that device in turn with a solar panel um, in a couple hours, depending on the size of the solar panel. So, sorry, I'm having a problem. Yeah, I would I would talk to that too while you're doing that, Lee. The no, idea, the idea of this portable electricity at the different levels I talked about is the fact that if you're an emergency manager and you want to shelter in place and you've got an area where elderly or the the just vulnerable shut off communities that you know have identified what you can do is an array of deployments so this isn't one one size 
what you have is you have the smaller equipment for those medical demands and then you can deploy as you need it. So it's a bit like the heavy rescue when we pull up on a scene, we don't pull all the tools off it. What I had was ability to address a situation with the right tool. And so it's really critical to understand from an emergency manager's point of view, we have the variables to deploy it. and understanding those variables so you can match it to your situation is part of my education. So it's critical to understand that yes, we can deploy different sizes for different medical needs. And I hand I don't know Will, how many did we hand out sources of electricity you hand out at that nursing home that night? I mean, it was it was incredible. Probably to be 20 able to of those little handhelds. Right. And I mean uh, yeah, I mean for I think it's really interesting conversation that should be uh, um, expanded on, but for particularly nursing home or senior living facility power, there's air conditioning is going to be really challenging to run the whole building, but it is very, very doable to, to, to hand out a portable power battery pack to every single room, which can run everything from the, you know, the cell phone recharging to nebula nebulizers, CPAP, even small scale oxygen concentration. Um, and that's, you know, we've been piloting for battery libraries for communities um, in New Orleans here. We're working on a couple programs there. So happy to discuss that um, more. I think it's a very, very simple and effective way to, to, to kind of save lives during large scale power outages. Great, and unfortunately that's all the time we've got right now, uh, but just wanted to thank everyone and let you know that uh, we're planning to offer this webinar with updates uh, on a quarterly basis. So um, if anyone uh, you know, would like to learn more or invite some of your colleagues to, to sit through this, like I said, we'll be offering it at least once a quarter, possibly more frequently depending on demand. Um, but, uh, uh, I think you have, uh, our contact information and, uh, uh, again, thanks so much, uh, for all this, we will record, uh, this has been recorded and Andy, I think we're going to be posting this on our YouTube channel. Are we not? Yeah, it'll be on the YouTube channel and we will actually send it out to, uh, all the attendees by email with a link to it. Fantastic. Um, all right, guys, uh, Rich and Will, thanks so much uh, for, for supporting us. And uh, to everyone, thanks and uh, have a great rest of your day.